right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. So I'm really happy to have uh, a classmate of mine, uh, Matt, from class of 1999, where both of us were undergrads some time ago. And uh, we've been super excited to bring Transit Screen, and Matt especially, to campus, since you might have seen uh, here in 650's office, or in Cabot House, or in Courier House, and soon elsewhere, uh, these so-called transit screens that allow students to get up to the minute uh, information on when the next Harvard shuttle is, when the next Uber is, when the next Hubway uh, bikes are available, and the like. Um, so today, Matt is here with us to talk about smart cities more generally and the power of harnessing this kind of data. So, I'll Great. see you, Matt. Thank you, David. And if you ever um, get tired of teaching CS50, uh, we might have a sales job for you. <laughs> All right. To, welcome to campus. Thank you. Um, well, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what, what I do and, and the kind of company that I and my, my uh, colleagues and co-founders have, have built at Transit Screen. But I also want to talk more generally about urban data, about smart cities data, and about how you too can get started building interesting um, interventions uh, that, that can help solve problems in cities. And uh, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a, uh, a step back, sort of a 30,000 foot view at the beginning, and uh, explain why cities and, and, and why now. And so the most uh, salient uh, thing you can take away from here is that uh, there are more people living out inside this circle uh, on the globe than outside it. And uh, you know we have a lot of international students here, so of course they appreciate that. Actually, let me, sorry, let me just stop my slideshow from going. I knew it was going to do that. OK, much better. Okay, thank you. So uh, there are more people living inside the circle, China and India primarily, than outside of it. And uh, the pace of urbanization has only increased over the last uh, you know, 20 to, to 40 years. So uh, just within India, for instance, the urban population is this red bar uh, continuing to increase. Uh, and, and the rural population is, is uh, sort of saturated or sort of declining. So what that means is uh, uh, tons of people moving to cities, density increasing. And that means all of the issues that come with that kind of uh, density are, are also cropping up. And uh, one of those major issues is transportation. Um, and uh, the way we see transportation at Transit Screen is that, uh, in, in the words of uh, Bogota Mayor Enrique Peñalosa, uh, who's in a great documentary called Urbanize that you might like, uh, the sign of an advanced society is not where the people who are poor drive cars, but where the rich uh, ride transit. And that's kind of uh, inevitable because when you have enough people and enough density, you, you just can't have everyone driving a, a car and, and getting around. And you'll just have gridlock like you do in many uh, cities in the developing world. And so uh, what we have to do is we have to find a way to shift some of that uh, to, to different modes in order to make uh, things uh, achievable. So uh, here's an example. I believe this is uh, from uh, South America, Br uh, Brazil, I think. And uh, this is the kind of uh, issue with transportation supply that you see with cities uh, with all this urbanization. Uh, and then uh, it, back here in the US, uh, we have a great example from the last decade of Houston. Houston has, this is the largest uh, freeway in the US and uh, possibly the world. It's 23 lanes wide. It's called the Katy Freeway and it goes from Houston West. Uh, and it is, uh, they put $3 billion into expanding it in 2011. And now traffic is 33% slower, even though they increase tolls. What happened? Well when they built all those new lanes and they allowed sprawling development uh, so that people who lived out in these uh, suburbs who could only get to the city to their jobs using this freeway uh, the result was uh, what's called induced demand so you increase the supply but that creates its own demand it's a feedback loop and so the the end result is actually worse than when they started and this is you know paradoxical but you know this is the mode that transportation solutions were for for the, the basically the last uh, 50 years was it was all this thinking that we could just fix it with supply, and that's, that's not actually the case. Uh, another manifestation of this is, is parking lots. Uh, so in terms of cars, uh, the, the number of cars continues to increase. There are actually 1.2 billion cars on the road today, uh, and, and 2 billion uh, continued by, by 2035. Um, with the urbanization uh, picking up a, a, as well, uh, the cars are, are sitting unused 96% of the time. And so, you know, this vast sea of parking is made for the day after Thanksgiving when everyone goes shopping. Uh, most of the time it's not used. Almost, you know, none of the time are these cars actually used. So if you think that the, the amount of this that is actually necessary, uh, you know, is, is just a fraction of this little car. So, so that's, you know, sort of a, a way to think about the, the scope of the problem. 
and uh, how people are, are looking for solutions. So what are these solutions in, in transportation going to look like? Well, I think one way to think about it is, is uh, that the transportation itself is, is changing and it's becoming mobility. So car companies are, are saying we're now mobility companies. What does that mean? Well, mobility it means essentially just getting around in a variety of ways. Um, and one of those ways that's very current and very relevant to uh, CS50, I think, and, and what people from uh, computer science backgrounds are going to end up doing in the future is uh, autonomous vehicles. So right now, there are 26 companies actively developing autonomous vehicle technologies, uh, ones you've heard of, of course, Google, Uber, but uh, you know Tesla, General Motors, Ford, and every other car company you could name has a research project in this area. Um, uh, one uh, Google uh, uh, scientist, uh, Sebastian Thrun, said that the going rate uh, for an acquisition of a uh, one scientist who's working in autonomous vehicles right now is $10 million. So you could just, you know, if you, if you have an active team working on this, you could just get scooped up by one of these people and, and, and you know, uh, that's, that's how the math works out. Um, Nevertheless, uh, autonomous vehicles are, you know, they're, they're here in some places, they're coming in some places. There are some autonomous taxis driving around Pittsburgh, autonomous Ubers, uh, and, and Google cars driving around too, but it's not really here yet. And it's not clear how they're going to work in an urban environment. That's still getting worked out. So in the meantime, let's focus on some other technologies that are really here and are really growing very fast uh, right now. Uh, one of those is, uh, surprisingly uh, to, to some people, bike share. And uh, so bike share in the last year, 1.5 billion trips were taken on, on bike share. Uh, there's now a company in China that's a bike sharing company that's worth, uh, valued at over a billion dollars, uh, so-called unicorn of, of bike sharing companies. So this is both a real commercial marketplace and a real transportation solution with 1.5 billion trips. Um, car share uh, is also been growing tremendously and every single car share vehicle like a zip car or a car to go vehicle uh, has been studied to and has been shown to take up to about 8 to 12 uh, vehicles off the road. So private cars, people who have second private cars will give up their car because it's, it costs a lot to maintain and they'll, they'll use a car share instead as their second car for those rare occasions when they actually need it. Um, so this is a still a pretty significant number of trips. Uh, it's it's uh, grown tremendously in Europe, but it's uh, still popular here in North America. Um, ride sharing, of course, uh, everyone's familiar with Uber and, and Lyft and uh, uh, Didi and all the growth of all of these services. Uh, there, it's still only f uh, four billion rides, but it's uh, increasing very rapidly. Um, so it's it's about twice as big as bike share right now. Um, and then mass transit. Uh, mass transit. I don't have the number offhand for how many people it's carrying, but it's it's a lot more than that, like by probably a factor of ten. And uh, mass transit is uh, still continuing to grow tremendously. Uh, you know, sometimes people think subways are old technology or something like that, but that's not actually true. Uh, and uh, there have been. 40 brand new metro systems built across the world in just the last decade, which basically means a doubling of the number of cities that have mass transit. So especially in, in countries like China, which have been building a ton of them. Um, so it's, it's uh, mobility has really changed. And the result of all this is that now more than ever before, it's more complicated to try to get around cities. You have more choices, but you need solutions for using uh, those choices and for getting informed about your, your different options. So this is just uh, one example of uh, how, how this, uh, uh, the diversity of, of things that people are doing in this space is, has uh, exploded. Uh, you can find this on our website, but uh, you know, it includes different on-demand mobility options and microtransit and stuff, as well as uh, some of these other uh, self-driving cars and other associated technologies. OK, so mobility has changed. Tremendous amount of activity there. What else is happening? Well in cities. And, and one of the trends that's enabling all these changes in mobility is uh, what we call smart cities. And, and related to that is this concept called the Internet of Things. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Internet of Things first because it's, it has a more specific definition. What the Internet of Things is, is really uh, putting sensors and, and other devices in the real world so that they're now connected to the Internet and are now enabled for uh, technology. Um, 
the idea of a smart city is a city in which you take all these connected devices and you use that to get some sort of you know, intelligence or some sort of operation uh, that, that um, makes everything more efficient, often more sustainable, greener, less CO2. And so uh, you see all of these, uh, these things, solar and car sharing and energy generation and, and houses and everything are all connected together and they, they all run efficiently like a, a giant machine. Um, the reality of that is that a lot of this stuff is still emerging. Here are a few examples of some smart state technologies that you might see today. Uh, and, and they're all sensor based, these ones, and they're all generating data that uh, often is being collected by cities, but sometimes is available for, for you and I to use in, in, in different ways in, in our own projects. So. Um, Here's an example of smart parking systems. So uh, in the old days, uh, you, cities had no idea who was parking in what space when. And so the reason that's a problem is because in many cities, 33% of traffic is uh, people circling looking for a parking spot. And so uh, when they can't find one, they keep circling and they keep causing massive amount of congestion. So the, the theory is, well, if we knew exactly what parking spots were available, we could direct people in their smart cars directly to those spaces and cut down on all the congestion and all the uh, the wasted uh, gasoline. So smart parking uh, is, is being done by both, uh, the, people put sensors in the parking spaces uh, themselves, uh, and, and that, that technology uh, unfortunately needs a lot of maintenance and, and batteries need to be replaced and so on. So uh, people are now looking at, at uh, sensors that are on light posts. Uh, you see all these light poles around the urban environment, and those can be retrofitted to put sensors on them for a variety of things. One of them is, is monitoring uh, using either video or, or some sort of uh, laser sensor or something uh, where these cars are parked. Um, but you could also imagine other uh, uses for, for that space. And so people are coming up with lots of neat uh, proposals for how to use uh, those uh, sensor packs. Um, another technology, and this is one that actually uh, is, is, I believe, deployed in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts here, is uh, something called, uh, it's a network of, of microphones called ShotSpotter. And what ShotSpotter is, is if uh, someone is uh, shooting a gun in the city, uh, it will tr these sensors, which are basically just uh, microphones, will triangulate the location. And in real time, that data then gets fed to the police department so that they know where to start you know, uh, their, their search for this, uh, this presumed gunman. Uh, you could imagine other uh, more peaceful applications for this kinds of technology. For instance, uh, you've got someone with a motorcycle that's uh, generating sound at 120 decibels. Uh, you know, it's a real nuisance. Uh, and, and in the past, you know, the police couldn't find them because they just ride away as soon as you got there. But you know, with a technology like this, maybe you can actually find them and, and uh, stop them, confiscate their motorcycle, and restore peace and quiet to the neighborhood. Um, Another uh, set of, of, of technologies that's, that's creating interesting sensor data, and a lot, most of this data is, is private for, for sort of privacy reasons, but it is widely available in the commercial sector, uh, is, is technology that, that monitors uh, your location through the, the use of your mobile phone and your connection to the cellular towers and the cellular networks. So they know, uh, you know you're in this car, you're driving, uh, the cellular network here is, it knows where you are because it has to transfer you from one tower to another. And then that data you know, says uh, you're moving, you're in a car and, and you're over there. Uh, it says there's a train going by and there's 200 people on the train, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of that kind of location data uh, can be used for a variety of purposes, including transportation planning, trying to figure out how congested things are and, and you know, where, what we should do about it. So uh, these are all examples of smart city sensors. And so all of these things are collecting data that could be used to make cities uh, run more efficiently and, and uh, smarter. Now, I'm a, a PhD in neuroscience, and so uh, although I work mostly on vision, which is a sense, uh, one of the five senses, I, I actually uh, you know, learned uh, during the course of my studies that sensing is only sort of half of the problem. And um, there's a metaphor from biology you can use, which says that a sensor is something that transforms energy into data. So, so you're walking around the world, and your senses are acquiring data about the world. Uh, at the same time, you as a person, you know, as an as a, as a animal or an organism, that's, that's not your, the point, right? The point isn't just to get data. The point is actually to do things in the world. And so what you need are actuators or, or activators, things that transform that data into energy. For us, it's, it's our muscles. You know, we, we walk over there, we, we pick up, you know, take a drink, et cetera. For cities, 
a lot of the smart city stuff that's been that you'll see uh, in in the media or, or just around the world uh, is focused on sensing, and it's not focused on actually getting stuff done, getting stuff, you know, making making a change in the world, activating things, and so this is actually the area that we're working on with Transit Screen. And so our goal, and you can see the transit screens in CS50 is one very small part of that, is to uh, put information, put real-time information all around the world in places where you live, places where you work, like uh, right here at CS50, uh, places where you play, like uh, these, these uh, bar jukeboxes that we just launched with touch tunes that now have transit information. Uh, we, you can have city halls on the streets or, or when you're traveling and vacationing or, or a hotel. So um, what's all this information is, is provided to do is to make people make different decisions and make people make better decisions. They might be more efficient decisions. For them, they might be more sustainable decisions. Usually when you give people more information, they'll shift away from whatever their default behavior is. And right now in transportation, people's default behavior is pretty bad. It's usually I get in my car and I drive or I take an Uber or something like that. So what you want is you want people to see the choices. Most of the choices are actually more sustainable. And so you end up with a better result when you provide the information. Um, the key is that in a smart city, people are the activators, they're the actuators. So you need to actually provide people with the information. It's not enough just to, to collect the data. You actually have to turn it information and then you have to get people to use it to change their behavior. So here's one of our transit screens close up here from uh, Cabot House, Harvard. Uh, just got some very nice feedback about this one. Uh, we had some uh, uh, one of the uh, CS50 TFs who uh, chooses his breakfast location so that he can see this uh, transit screen. So then he can take a you know whether the shuttle is coming or maybe he'll take a Hubway bike share. He has a choice uh, based on that. And so that's a great example of behavioral change, right? He's he's changing uh, where he sits in the dining hall, and then he, based on that, he's also changing what kind of uh, uh, travel he he uses. So what else, um, what other examples are there of uh, behavioral change? Well, uh, one, one very interesting example is another company uh, called uh, Opower that's also based in Washington, D.C. area. And uh, what they did is they took all of this smart city data about people's energy usage. And uh, sort of, you know, you, you might have an apartment or a home and you use energy at a certain rate. Here, this is how many kilowatt hours you, you used. And then, you know, this is uh, how much you paid last month for your energy bills. Now, um, this is the average because they have data from, from all everyone in Cambridge, say. They, they know what sort of the average home in Cambridge uses in terms of energy. And then, in this case, this person here, uh, Garrett, uh, he's, he's using more. And so the objective of, of Opower's uh, software here is that uh, they, they have this dashboard here so that they, he can see that he is using more and, and that you know, maybe there are some things he can do, specifically turn off lights or compete against other people to reduce his energy usage. There, there are things he can do. They're kind of long-term things, but they can ultimately save him money and uh, improve the environment. So. This is something where they're taking data that was previously unavailable because meters didn't used to be smart, but now they are. They're feeding that data into the internet. And Opower built a business where using a combination of web technologies and also just, just they even mail this information to you in a letter because they know you're more likely to look at it. Uh, they were able to, to find ways to reduce energy usage in uh, different cities around uh, the country. And, uh, uh, Coincidentally enough, Opower was actually founded by a couple of our other classmates, uh, mine and David's. Uh, these guys, uh, uh, Alex and uh, Dan, and uh, they actually went public a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, and this is them on the New York Stock Exchange floor. So uh, there's a lot of a real impact uh, and also real potential in, in some of these kinds of businesses that are based on uh, the idea of smart cities. All right. so. Um, that's kind of the background for, for smart cities and, and data and you know, both the, the sensor and the, the activator side. Um, so what I want to talk about next is kind of a little bit of how you can get started you know, by yourself in working in this area. And really the easiest way to get started is um, with open data. And um, in case you haven't heard of open data, it's, it, the idea of open data is this. 
It's data that can be freely used, reused, or redistributed by anyone, subject only to, at most, you say it's from a certain source. Um, and so it's often uh, required to be, you could say it's available in machine readable formats. So if I give you a stack of, of paper that's not open data, it's got to be in you know, data format. And then it also ought to be available in its entirety. So, so if I have to log into you know, some website and take a screenshot or just take, you know, scrape the web or something like that, that's not, that's not open data either. I have to be able to get it like, a, like a, a table, like an Excel file, or I have to be able to get uh, some sort of uh, interchange format like XML or JSON or these other kinds of things. So, so open data is often generated by the government, but not always, because governments have to be you know, public and transparent about their data, so, so they have to share it with citizens. And the result of, of this, and there's been a, a lot of open data uh, momentum recently, um, the result of this is that it's a really good way to get started, because you know, with some of this other stuff, like the, this data, you know, um, a few years ago, you weren't able to get this data from the energy companies, right? Your utility, you'd say, well, I, you know, I, I have a really great idea and I'd like to be able to do something to make uh, you know, my home more efficient. And they'd say, too bad, you can't have the data. You know, you're, you're, not, you're our customer, you're not our partner. Um, but with the government involved and generating this data, for instance, um, the, the Boston T, the MBTA, is a government agency. And so they provide open data that's available to a lot of people and uh, without very, very many restrictions on it. So one of the impacts of this is that you can develop your, your app or you can even develop a business based on open data. And uh, so you know, you're no longer required, say, for the T. Uh, I'm not even sure if they have their own like, MBTA app or not, but uh, there are a lot of other apps you can use on your mobile phone uh, that, that allow you to get information about them. Transit Screen is another example of, of uh, something that uses open data from the T, as well as uh, you know, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of other agencies around the world. Um, and then you know, another th nice thing about this is that there are many different people contributing to open data. So it, it doesn't just have to be sourced from the government. Someone can come along and say, well, I, I think this data format set would be better in this format, or it would be easier to use or something. And you can clean it up and, and then redistribute it. And then you know, the results of all this kind of activity is that people can build little businesses on it. And so uh, I'm just going to plug the uh, startup incubator that we come from, which is uh, in Washington, D.C., and it's called 1776. And their mission is to solve hard problems in the areas of cities and government and healthcare and education and, and transportation, a lot of which can be addressed using uh, some form of open data. Um, like I said, uh, the, the U.S. federal government has gotten behind this, this crusade of openness and transparency. And so uh, the Obama administration uh, had a pronouncement and they created an uh, independent authority under the uh, U.S. CTO's office to promote open data. And uh, this was me at meeting president at 1776. I just wanted to show the slide. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a couple different examples of open data uh, and, and things you can actually use. Uh, these ones are, are ones that I know well because they're relevant to transportation for the most part. Uh, but there's a whole variety of different sources out there that you can go to. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, four different areas very quickly. One of them is open geographic data, so maps, um, open street map uh, specifically, which is like the Wikipedia of maps. Uh, GTFS, which is uh, how transit schedules are represented, and it's been a very successful open data standard. Um, Real-time APIs, so this is just transit schedules, but if you want to know where a, a train is right now, you need to use a real-time API. And then uh, energy data. Uh, so there's some new standards there that we can talk about. So OpenStreetMap, a lot of people have heard about Google Maps. Uh, they're kind of the standard. Uh, some people have even heard of Apple Maps. Um, and OpenStreetMap is less well known, but it underlies a tremendous amount of activity on the internet. And it's really at sort of world-class standards right now. So this was uh, uh, Sochi Olympics, the Winter Olympics uh, before the, the last Summer Olympics. And uh, during that time, Sochi is a Russian city that not a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, they kind of built it up for the Olympics. Uh, this is what OpenStreetMap looked like during that Olympics. So if you were a visitor and you were, you were trying to use, uh, trying to get your, find your way around, you could see all the buildings, you can see all the new paths, the Olympic Park, et cetera. And this is what it looked like in, uh, in Google Maps. So 
you know, Google, which is a uh, reminder, is a company that has you know, hundreds of billions of dollars sitting around, didn't really prepare for the Olympics or even get the data together. Uh, whereas a community of people, just like Wikipedia editors, people generating their own open data, uh, managed to, to achieve this in OpenStreetMap. So uh, last Olympics, uh, it, it, it wasn't quite as clear a uh, distinction because Google actually put a lot of money into making sure that the last Summer Olympics uh, wasn't like this for them. Um, so OpenStreetMap is, is one of these uh, open data sets that's not generated by a government, although in many cases it uses government data. It's generated by crowdsourcing like Wikipedia. So here's an interesting map showing the number of edits uh, in, in each of these sort of geographic areas. Uh, you know, one thing to notice is that in many of these areas in Europe, there's, uh, I think this is per square kilometer or something, it's like over 500,000 edits per square kilometer, which is just you know, amazing. Like you're really, you're really uh, c converging very quickly on, on sort of ground truth when you have that kind of activity. And the US is not, uh, not too far behind. So you yourself can actually edit OpenStreetMap. It's very easy. You just go to OpenStreetMap.org and, and start editing stuff that you know. Um, one thing you can do with it, and this, I think this is kind of a neat thing, is uh, in some cities, uh, the, the sidewalks and pedestrian paths aren't very well represented. So if, if you know, let's say that uh, you have an elderly relative who uses like a, 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 a wheelchair or a scooter or something like that, uh, they're not going to be able to get from, from point A to point B or, or to, to have you know, an app tell them uh, how they can safely get from one point to another. Um, they'll just have to discover it by themselves. But you can actually go into OpenStreetMap and edit these paths, say, here's an accessible path. Uh, there, there's a curb here, so you, if you're using a wheelchair, you can't jump over that, and, and so on. And then this all gets put into uh, trip planning uh, apps, so that you know when you're using uh, one of these apps, uh, like like a, a city navigation app, it'll actually now give you these paths, and and you know you could uh, build an app for someone who's using a wheelchair that says, how can I actually get from point A to point B in a, in a safe way, and. So you can build that for your local community and then extend that out you know, as, as, uh, as you grow. So I think this is really an interesting uh, use of open data where you can actually solve a real problem. And then you can also maybe build a, an app or a, a, even a company on something like that. Here's another interesting use of, of data. You can um, look at, uh, uh, use a sort of open uh, satellite data to uh, measure the solar potential of uh, different buildings in the city. So this is a solar map of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this is showing that uh, there's actually uh, some parts of the roof here could actually have uh, uh, solar installations on here that could you know, theoretically generate uh, a lot of uh, power for this building. And then you could even measure you know, using open data from uh, the electric utility about how much they charge and so on. You could say, well, how long will it take me to pay off the solar panels and so on. Um, does CS50 have uh, solar panels? Not yet. All right. Working on it. So uh, another interesting application of all this geodata is, is you can do custom styles. And there's a, uh, a great company we work with called Mapbox uh, that's based in Washington, DC. And they've built a whole business on open data uh, and on using different ways to, to interact with it. So uh, this is, they have a, a styling language that's kind of like, kind of like how you use uh, you know, HTML to, to make the web pages look different. They've uh, created languages for making maps look different. And so these are all, you know, they look completely completely different, right? And yet, they're all generated with the same open data, with the same open street map data, just with different styling rules applied. So you guys could actually see these examples online. You could edit them and, and change them uh, yourself and come up with maps that look you know, ranging from, this is very similar to Google Maps, to uh, something that's more like a, a hiking map or a sort of a 50s style map or, or uh, even a sort of comic book kind of map. So, all these different styles are, are, are now available because the data exists. So that's uh, geographical data. And, and that's a really important source of, of, of knowledge about the world. Lots of great solutions to, be, to urban problems can be found with geodata. Um, another kind of open data that I, I know very well and that, that I think has been a real success story is called uh, GTFS. And this is uh, the general transit feed specification. You don't need to know that. Basically, all you need to know is that it's uh, transit schedules. So when is the bus running from, from A to B and, uh, and where? So uh, there are a couple places where you can explore this kind of data uh, and get started. Um, one great one is uh, called uh, transit feeds. 
and uh, it's it's I think it's a transit just just a, a search for transit feeds and you can find it you can actually click through it this is San Francisco you can find the latest file you can look for a certain route and then the the data is all available to download uh, that that powers this particular visualization another really uh, nice tool that's been developing very quickly uh, from a company called map Zen that we work with is uh, called transit land and so transit land um, has uh, data, it's, it's what's called a data commons, which is that they're taking all open data from all over the world, all over the planet, and bring it together in one place so that you can see everything sort of on an equal footing. You know, you have uh, data from, from you know, uh, uh, Sydney, Australia, and then you have data from San Francisco, and it's all in the same standard and the same format. So you can take a solution that you develop that works for San Francisco, and you can immediately make it work for Sydney, Australia. Um, so GTFS, uh, one of the reasons I like it, and one of the reasons I'm talking about it, is that uh, it's actually really simple. And so uh, it's, it's plain text files, and it's written in tables. So if you download a GTFS file, it's like a zip file, and it's got this stuff in it. Uh, all, these things all have formats. But if you just double click on one of them, stops.txt, open that up, and this is what it looks like. It's got a list of stops, the names of those stops, latitudes and longitudes so you can plot it on your open street map and then some other information here so it's it's the kind of data that you can really start exploring and start building on very uh, readily of course it's a little bit more complicated and if you really want to do some complicated things uh, you, you'll have to start working a little bit with databases or at least uh, matching data from one thing to another but uh, it's not it's not terribly complex and uh, there are tools that are available that are mostly open source uh, easy to download that are that can be used for this kind of stuff um, so you know for instance those stops I showed you are linked to particular stop times uh, and to certain bus trips and so on. So you can, you can actually go from, from one thing to another and, and, and match all these things up in the, in the database. Another interesting source of data from around here is um, bike share data. And a lot of bike share data is, is open um, in, in DC. I helped uh, open that up, but then other cities like Boston have just, uh, just done that uh, from the beginning. Uh, and so uh, here's an interesting example of someone who, uh, they had a contest for, for visualizing Hubway data, and uh, so you know they, they, uh, they resulted in a really nice visualization of trips versus I think uh, a distance, um, and and they have actual trip history here, so you can see not just your trips or just what the stations are, but you can actually see uh, how many people have traveled from what part to what other part, and so that's the kind of like like the the more the the sort of uh, monitoring data or the uh, the real historical data that we're talking about a lot of that is available with bike share so if you're interested in you know what you could do if you had data from everyone's cellular records of how they got from point A to point B then then bike share is sort of an interesting way you might want to get started with something like that because it is open so all of that data is is static data right the maps are just static the schedule never changes and, and the bike share data is, is the history of the bike share system. When you're talking about real-time data, stuff that's actually happening right now in real time, um, you're not talking about data sets anymore. You're really talking about APIs. And I think uh, APIs are covered later in the course, right, uh, sort of towards the end. But uh, basically, uh, all an API is is the way you talk to a another program or the way you talk to a database about something. And, and so you can get information from that program or from that database that you can then use. And if, if that database is, is changing, is updating in real time, then you have that information and it's up to the minute or up to the second and you can use it. So um, a lot of APIs can actually be uh, accessed just through your web browser. So in many cases, uh, if you have an API, you can just type the, uh, you know, the, the name of the, the so-called endpoint into your web browser, and then you'll get out uh, in, a, in a readable format. This one's called JSON, J-S-O-N. Uh, you can get information. So here's one from uh, a transit service, and it says, well, uh, here are the stop times. Here, there's an arrival coming up. Don't worry about the, the, the numbers. This is in a particular format. Uh, but the point is, uh, you know, this, this one is uh, just zero seconds from the stop. So the train is, is, has just gotten to the stop. And now you know that because you called that API and, and you got information back. And now your program can use that too. You can put it up on a screen like we do, or you can do other things with it. Um, APIs are readable by code. This is uh, Twitter, and this is someone's tweet. 
this is not what I would consider to be an API. I mean, you can get tweets but, uh, it, from an API, but it's not the same because this information isn't structured, right? It's just someone's typing, and it's very hard to know what to do with that to write a program that can use all of this text. Whereas with this, I can write a program that says, I want this, then I want that, then I want this part. So it, there's, there's a big difference, and it's a lot easier to work with APIs that generate machine-readable data than, than other data. Um, another key property of, of APIs uh, is that some of them are giving you bulk data, and some of them are like family style, uh, and some are giving you single serving. So we just had, went to a Chinese restaurant. Uh, there was a buffet. You could take as much as you want. If you're particularly rude, you could just grab everything and, and you know walk out the door with it. Uh, APIs are like that, except uh, of course you can get the, the the food, and someone else can also get the food. Uh, and so some of them will tell you about, for instance, where every train is in the entire uh, metro system in DC here. And so one API call will tell you all of that. Uh, there are also some a uh, APIs for Metro that will tell you about a particular stop. And so you just ask about one stop, that's your single serving API. And that can say, you know, there's a train right now at 16th and Colorado, or going to 16th and Colorado. So I um, want to show you another example of, uh, or, or uh, just uh, related to the energy data stuff that I was talking about. Um, so. There's also uh, a website for, for energy data, uh, like I showed in the O-Power example, and it's called, it's, uh, called Green Button. And uh, what it is is the uh, US uh, uh, data.gov office and the EPA created a standard for interchanging energy data. So uh, if you have an apartment uh, or a, you know, a, a condo or whatever, or a house, and you're pay paying energy bills to a certain uh, set of, of utilities, they are required to, to give you access to uh, your own historical energy usage data. So there should be on, on the you know, a customer portal website a uh, login that you can get, and, and, and then there, there should be one of these green buttons that allows you to access your own data and pull that data down, and then you can do whatever you want with it. You can plot your own historical use, you can try to optimize it, you can compare it to other things, and so uh, this is also now an open data ecosystem, and uh, last time I looked there were about 250 apps people had built using this kind of green button data. So this is a, another interesting place to get started if you have a, a, a paying a utility bill. Um, not sure if, uh, if Harvard is doing this right now for students, but uh, if you're living off campus, you can probably get this. So um, some places you can get inspired uh, to, to come up with different project ideas for smart cities using open data. Uh, one of them is, is like I said, data.gov. And data.gov is a place where you can find almost an infinite number of open data sets. It's, it can be a little bit uh, overwhelming just trying to figure out what's available there, but uh, they let you sort them by uh, different types of things that you're interested in. You might be interested in transportation, you might be interested in energy, you might be interested in agriculture. All of those data sets are available there, and you can, you can find a catalog of them and then start generating ideas for how you might use some of that data to get some insight or, or maybe build uh, an app that would be useful to people. Um, there's another class of kind of places like that called developer portals. And so for instance, uh, for, for MBTA, for the Boston T, they have a developer portal that you can, you can use. And uh, you sign up, with a get a login for that, and then you get access to their open data. Uh, you get access to their APIs as well, and, and a variety of other things. Um, so, so often if you're uh, looking to uh, find some, some open data, um, you might be able to, to look for it by looking for a, a developer's site. Um, there are some other catalogs of other APIs. There are a lot of private APIs uh, from other services, uh, so things you might use. Uh, Yelp, uh, if you use that to search for restaurants or lo local businesses, they have an API you can use. Foursquare has an API. Uh, a variety of other uh, uh, different commercial APIs exist. Google Maps, you can use their data to some extent. Uh, and all these things uh, have, have some way to access them, and it's often free. So uh, you can find some of them uh, just by searching for developer portals, like Yelp Developer Portal. But uh, there are also other catalogs you can use, too, like uh, publicapis.com is a, a, a one that seems fairly recent that I came across. Uh, there's an old one called uh, programmableweb.com that's uh, been around for a long time and has a lot of uh, APIs, uh, that some of which go back almost you know, 10 or, or even 15 years. Um, 
So all of these places are good ways to sort of discover the richness of what's available uh, in terms of APIs. Uh, and then uh, and open data and then green button data that's the one that I mentioned for their energy uh, data as well and even if you don't have a, a, a apartment or a house and you don't pay a utility bill you can still get test data uh, from these kinds of sites that would allow you to build an app uh, that would be based on that, that test data and many of these will also allow you to, to, to test uh, certain things about against them so um, I hope that's been sort of a rapid fire introduction to some of the different uh, aspects of data and APIs and uh, especially where it relates to cities and the kinds of data sources that you have uh, in cities and for solving uh, urban problems. Uh, so I just wanted to wrap up a little bit uh, by showing some uh, more slides of our team. This is our, our DC team uh, for transit screen. Uh, and of course, uh, mentioned that that we're very interested in having any of the CS50 students uh, or, or any anyone else who's interested. Uh, please drop us a line if you're interested in a summer internship or, or a job or whatever. Uh, please let us know. Um, we're, we tend to be very mission driven and we're focused on making cities more sustainable, uh, promoting walkability, urbanization, and public health, and uh, our own uh, operations are actually carbon neutral. And I wish I had a better way to do that and to show that with open data, but uh, we've, we've managed to uh, audit our own energy usage and prove that. And then also uh, zero of our employees commute by car, so we get around a lot of fun ways in the city. And so uh, just you know, want to say sort of in conclusion, uh, the way that, that I, my personal opinion about this goes is that in, in, a, in a truly smart city is not one just where all the data gets brought together and kind of funneled into, into some sort of silo to be used by people in the government. It's one where, where data is open and data is shared uh, so that, that data and the technology can be used to improve the lives of, of everyone uh, from you know, people who, from the janitor to the CEO, people who are old, people who are young, uh, and, and, and just the whole variety of, of residents of, of, and citizens of the city. So, so I really tend to think about smart citizens as being the goal rather than smart cities and and I think that um, that's a good way to sort of keep in mind uh, you know the, the real problems that need to be addressed and the real problems that can be solved um, so uh, this is my email is Matt at transitscreen.com feel free to drop me a line uh, this is a picture from uh, 1999 of uh, me and Leverett house uh, dining hall which is I believe closed right now this painting was uh, hang hung upside down for half the year that year and no one noticed um, <laughs> And uh, these are a couple shots of me on the uh, computer programming competition, especially if you're uh, just starting CS50 and you're interested. I, I think there are tryout processes for these, so you can, you can go and try to uh, uh, get yourself on the, on the international programming team. I got to go to uh, exciting San Jose this, uh, this year, and this year was a little more exciting. We got to go to Amsterdam uh, for the, uh, the international finals. Uh, look at these computers, just going to say. Look. Um, and uh, then a bit later, you know, I got to, to see the computer is a lot newer in this one. That's all I'm going to say about that one. All right. So thanks very much and um, appreciate your attention. And uh, again, please drop me a line if you'd like. And uh, I'd love to take any questions from the audience at this point. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Matt. This is uh, really helpful. Uh, my name is Amir. I'm a CS50 student. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I feel like when I hear about smart cities, um, the topics that you brought up come into play a lot. A lot of it's about transportation and then a bit about energy. Where aren't people looking and where do you think should the next wave of progress in smart cities can be? Yeah. Um, well, if, I think if, if I, back when we started transit screen, people weren't really working in transportation enough. So that was one area that we thought was, was uh, really open for exploration. I think that's less true now than it, than it was at the time. Um, you know, I think I'd, I'd sort of turn that back to you and say, you know, what are you really interested in and, and what, you know, where do you see data that's kind of um, being underused? Because there's, there's definitely, you know, if you think of, um, you know, what, what, it, what are the different sectors that make up a city? You know, there's, there's housing, there's, there's uh, transportation, there's retail, there's energy, there's all these different inputs and outputs to the cities. Um, and some of those are going to be on the verge of opening up more data or, or you know, uh, where you can put together the data you need out of, from interesting sources, kind of combine things in ways that people haven't looked at before. 
Um, so, you know, for instance, I'll just I'll just give an example off the top of my head. I, I talked to a guy who was um, uh, in DC, and he was he was uh, in a sort of software development uh, training program, and he was a um, a labor inspector. Uh, so he was looking for workers who were being cheated out of their wages by by uh, businesses that were uh, you know unethical, and. Uh, he thought, well, you know, there, there's no data set I can use that, that will tell me whether a business is shady or not. I mean, maybe you can find bad reviews on Yelp or something like that, but maybe not. Um, so he thought, well, what else would be a sign that the business is either shady or maybe falling apart and unable to manage itself properly, which makes it likely to not underpay uh, its workers? And uh, health inspection data for restaurants turns out to be an open data set that's available in a lot of cities, including New York City, uh, and I, I think maybe even Cambridge. So uh, he took that data set and combined it with some, some internal data sets that he had access to and showed that actually it, it was true. You could look, if you just went to inspect restaurants that were already failing their health exams, uh, you could probably also predict with some accuracy which ones were likely to be underpaying their workers because those are probably restaurants that are falling apart or something. So, so you know, I thought that was a really interesting example of, of using a data set that was maybe not intuitive. And so th I, th I think there's a little bit of creativity that you have to pull in uh, when it comes to this. And it really should be kind of problem focused. Mm -hmm. So like you're not really taking away from like people who actually drive. Yeah. How does, yeah. Yeah. So that this gets into sort of uh, interesting areas of um, uh, something called like uh, mobility management or transportation demand management, which is you know instead of instead of paying a ton of money to build bigger roads, how can we um, uh, be more efficient and and change people's uh, demand behavior for those roads or for these uh, for transit or something, uh, and. The, there are a lot of incentives you can use. Information is, is sort of fundamental because if people don't have information about a bus, you know, that they don't know it runs by them, they're never going to use it, right? So, so someone who might actually have a very convenient trip by bus uh, might just drive because they've never heard of the bus before, they've never seen it. So there's a real education component we try to address. And the other thing we try to do is, is we try to be in places um, where uh, people have just, just moved. Uh, so you just move into a new condo building, um, and so you could do a variety of things, right? You might have a car. You might bring the car and pay for parking, or you might decide to leave the car and just use transit and, and bike share and Uber. And so if we can get you at that point when you're making that kind of decision to keep the car, to get rid of the car, to start driving to work or to, to start learning how to use transit to get to work, if we can get you then, then we have the ability to change your behavior uh, and we have a, a special amount of leverage. It's, it's when, when you, you know, people are new to a place or people's habits are already changing that you have the ability. And there's, there's, there's some good research in this area and sort of behavioral change. Um, there are a few things, I, um, I, uh, other books I'd like to sort of mention in that area. Uh, there's, there's one called Nudge, which is a really sort of interesting popular read about how to, uh, you can influence people's behavior using uh, sort of e economic uh, principles, uh, written by a guy who, who uh, taught here. Uh, and um, there's uh, a couple other books on, uh, called, in the area called Action Design. And so this is about uh, d design as it applies to getting people to change their behavior um, for the better. And so uh, I th there's a whole interesting area of exploration there. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, uh, my name is Farbana, and I work at planning office mm -hmm. at Harvard uh, with the campus planning. So you're talking about the smart cities. So yeah. 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 So, so the question is, what, 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 yeah, bringing it close to home, what makes a, a, a smart campus uh, as opposed to sort of a, a broader smart city? And I, you know, I think 
uh, you know, the, the fact that you are from the Office of Planning and the university has an Office of Planning is, is sort of uh, underscores the, the idea that a campus is kind of like a miniature city in many ways. I'm sure you look at it uh, under a, a similar lens. Um, and so, you know, I would say that, that the areas um, of, of, you know, for a smart campus, um, you know, obviously you want to, to there, there are some standards that everyone on the campus can, can agree on similar to the city. You, you want to be a sustainable campus. You want to be a, you know, an efficient campus. Um, and, and you want people to feel, you know, safe on campus and, and so on. Uh, so I think, I think really, um, you know, you look at all the different areas, you know, it's, it's law enforcement or it's, or it's uh, sustainability or transportation, everything where there's an, uh, a similarity between a campus and, and the city, um, you know, all of those areas are areas where, uh, you know, you can, you can help make the, the, the student body smarter. At the same time, there's also a, a workforce who has to get to the campus, right? So you're, you're dealing with those transportation problems at the same time. And so how do you, you know, get, get people from, their, from the suburbs or from Boston, and, and how do you get them in here in, in a way that doesn't create, you know, problems for, for everyone? And so I think um, for a, a campus, you need to think a little bit more expansively, not just about the footprint of the campus, but about the whole network of, of how everyone is, is coming uh, to and from uh, the campus. Um, transit screen, uh, just to, to tell another uh, short story, comes from a city called Arlington, Virginia. We actually did it in, within the, uh, the city government as a pilot project before we launched the startup. And uh, Arlington is, is a sort of interesting, almost like a campus in the, in the way that it, it has uh, only 150,000 people, but almost 250,000 people working in it. So there's a, a flood of people coming in every day um, because of the, the Pentagon is there and, and a variety of other major employers. So uh, there's a real need for um, solutions that, that take into account the whole footprint of of the campus. I, uh, that's kind of the direction I would go in, but I'd love to talk with you uh, about that more. Why not? Is it like sensors? Like, who has access to information from the sensors? Can anyone request like, access? Yeah, so, so that's, that's the challenge, right? Is that uh, a lot of, like, for instance, that uh, the gunshot detectors, yeah. you know, that's the police's thing. They're not going to share that, right? Okay. Um, but sometimes with sensors, you can get a certain data set or you can get a historical data set uh, that preserves some kind of privacy. Um, so uh, for instance, um, it, with New York City, uh, you can get a, a, a data set that has uh, all the taxi trips that were taken in the city. Or with bike share, you've got a history of the bike share trips. And so some of those, those were you know, uh, with, uh, collected with sensors. And you, but you can't get them in real time, but you can get them historically. And so I would focus on that kind of data, or of course, you know, uh, you might even try to put a, your own sensor out uh, somewhere, you know. If you want interested in video, you know, put a camera up somewhere and uh, start collecting that data. Wait, so what would incentivize like, those companies to release their real-time data for everyone? Like, why would companies do that? Generally, they don't. Okay. They, they, they don't share that kind of sensor data because... Okay. Um, we are able to access like API, like the transit information. Like, right. Why would, is that just like what the government wants to? So there are two things that make uh, companies often uh, share their data. One is if there's like a public policy reason, like uh, the government says you should have open data uh, or because of transparency. Let's say the, the subway isn't running very well, uh, you know, or it's not running on time. Uh, maybe people should have the right to look at the data and say whether it's r running on time or not. Um, subways don't always see it that way, but that might be one reason to release the data. The other uh, reason people release data is often uh, just related to marketing and, and promotion. So why do we get data from so many public and private uh, transportation providers at Transit Screen? Because we promote their services on public screens, and so we're free advertising for these kinds of agencies. And so uh, if, if you can identify a common interest where you know, another thing is maybe a company doesn't have enough people uh, to do all the analysis they'd like. Maybe they don't have data scientists, but they have data. So you might be able to say, well, if you share this data with me, uh, I can, you know, do some things with it that might provide insight or information to you that make 
you you know run your business better. So so there are a variety of different pitches you know from the the regulation. There's even something called the Freedom of Information Act where you can request data from from a, a lot of public agencies. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, there's a site called MuckRock.com that's really good for it. Uh, and but then you know there's often uh, some kind of common interest, and I think that's that's maybe in many cases with private companies is a better way to go. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.